So thank you everybody for joining this, um, this Waterfront um, webinar. Um, it's quite a, a big topic that we're trying to um, deal with in a, a very short um, period of time. So we're going to be looking at preparing for the increase in wind development. Um, so it's planning for the future and how, how we are actually going to be um, achieving this. This in the background of delivering 50 gigawatts um, to 20 um, by 2030 with five gigawatts of, of floating wind, um, which in, in itself is um, quite, quite an achievement. So I'm Sandra Painter, I'm an offshore consents manager for RWE Renewables, and I support our portfolio of um, operational sites. There's about 10, well, we have 10 um, operational sites um, in the UK. I've worked in the industry for about 30 years on, on and offshore as a consultant and, and developer. Um, and I'll be acting as chair for today's session um, and introduce the um, our three speakers that we have lined up um, for, um, for this topic. So just in sort of a, a brief introduction, I mean, as an industry, we've um, been pretty relentless and successful at pushing at boundaries. Um, our current challenge, however, is, is a huge one. Um, and one that we're due to deliver um, as an industry in less than a decade, um, that being the average time taken to date to deliver commercial um, offshore wind farms. So 13 gigawatts to 50 gigawatts in eight years, um, it's not, not for the faint hearted um, and also to be delivered, not forgetting, you know, no compromise on um, health, health and safety. Um, so we're going to have to navigate and coordinate sort of quite a, a few a few challenges um, going through the, the consenting process, um, net zero, um, gearing and supporting the, the supply chain, grid connection, um, as well as keeping all of our stakeholders on the same page um, and developers um, uh, as us um, to ensure that we can actually um, deliver this. And this is what will be touched upon um, and, and developed further by our, um, by our speakers. So they'll each have about 10 minutes each um, to make their presentations. Um, we're going to be starting with um, Megan Arnold, um, who has sort of a, yes, a much experience in, in the wind industry spanning um, 30 years. I remember from um, BWA days um, way back then, um, now running her own consultancy, um, Entwined Earth, and is the regional development manager for South America, as well as senior development manager for um, Enterprise Energy. Um, the second speaker will be Jamie Baldwin, who is um, one of Orsted's project directors with 20 years experience um, working in renewables. Um, most recently worked on Hornsey 4 project um, through that whole sort of DCO um, and examination process. And last but not least, um, Poppy um, Tremaine, a colleague from RWE, um, who is the stakeholder and consultation manager, um, who has been currently working on the consultation for Owley Moor Offshore Wind Farm, um, which is one of RWE's project in, in Wales and um, working on that um, DCO process and um, currently consultation process. Um, so those are the three speakers. Um, if Everybody could please hold their Q&As. Um, well, we'll be going through the Q&As at the end of the three presentations, um, but if you could please put in your questions in the Q&A function, then we can collect them and sort of have a, a sort of 10 minute discussion um, at the end. That, that would be great. So thank you. And I will now pass on to Megan for, for your presentation, please. Thanks very much, Sandra. Good morning or afternoon, wherever anyone may be dialing in from. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the history uh, at the early days of offshore wind and uh, and then where we are today. So um, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, back in early 2000, when I joined the UK wind industry, there was a grand total of zero megawatts of offshore wind and not much more globally either. In Denmark and Bondaby offshore wind farm, the first in Europe, it was in four metres of water, two kilometres from the shore and just under five megawatts of installed capacity. It took another four years to install another five megawatts again in Denmark and another five years for an industry's geared step change when in 2000 the Danish Middle Grunden offshore wind farm was installed with just 40 megawatts. At the time in the UK there were a few lonely voices talking about offshore wind and I was working for a UK SME in Lowestoft called SLP Engineering. I'd been brought in to help find new uh, forms of energy to sustain the workforce and help smooth out the cyclical feast of famine cycle uh, associated with oil and gas fabrication. This was in the heat of the CCGT market and the dash for gas and European relationships being forged across Europe. I might have been biased. I disclose I used to work for Greenpeace and it was the growing onshore wind industry that piqued my interest and its possibility to transition our workforce into this new clean and green marine sector. From the window in my office, there were at times an empty yard with an incredibly skilled workforce. However, across the industry, oil and gas workers were aging and those who were younger or could were disappearing off to the Middle East and chasing the work. The average age of an oil and gas worker at the time was 61, and that workforce was about to retire. In my mind, there was a window of opportunity to capture the lessons learned and use the depth of talent to create a deeply experienced and incredibly knowledgeable UK workforce to operate a successful offshore wind industry. In 2001, I was lucky enough to be voted onto the Board of Renewables UK, the then British Wind Energy Association. The majority of board members reflected the then membership, which were onshore developers, and building a supply chain wasn't a big focus. Getting planning permission was. A small handful of people and companies were keen to get government and the Crown Estate to consider opening a licensing program for offshore wind. It wasn't easy. There was real resistance from certain quarters the oil and gas industry, the nuclear lobby, and even some in onshore wind. Along with literally a handful of people, we lobbied to get offshore recognised as a legitimate future source for the UK. I remember bringing 40 people from a nascent offshore supply chain into a room and asking each of them to provide £1,000 to create a funding plot for offshore wind for Renewables UK. That day, 40 people went back to their respective organisations and companies and each lobbied for the funds. Within a week, each one of them had put forward a contribution. We had £40,000 to get really started. I think back and our vision was pretty immense. We wanted the UK to have the largest offshore wind market in Europe and we succeeded in that vision. But that wasn't all we wanted. We wanted a vibrant supply chain. We wanted to see a British wind turbine manufacturer. We wanted our seaside towns rejuvenated and vibrant jobs and poor infrastructure upgraded for the new marine industry. We saw a huge green economy at our fingertips and I, for one, wanted more women in it. Today, in 2022, the UK has the largest installed offshore capacity in Europe and is only second to China in the globe. Unfortunately, it hasn't had all the supply chain successes that we'd hoped for back at the start of the century. Whilst two multinational British companies were in talk with the government to start a wind turbine manufacturing business, the support from government for innovation just wasn't forthcoming. An oil and gas construction yard at the time asked for 10 million in funding to support to install robotics to manufacture jacket foundations to be turned down, and the supply chain went to other European countries. The fight for UK content then became a lobbying exercise to convince foreign manufacturers to use our component supplies or to set up manufacturing and assembly factories in the UK. We have seen tier two suppliers struggle to supply both on and offshore markets. It's nearly impossible to compete on steel fabrication works for towers or foundations, and factories have come and gone. Our ports have struggled to get inward investment to modify and upgrade and to meet the growing requirements for vessels or, or even for the two, tier two and three components to be made and supplied to other original equipment manufacturers. Whilst we've had some notable successes, I can't help thinking the UK lost a real opportunity at the beginning to put UK manufacturing and content at the heart of our installed capacity. There are companies now doing this, but it took a long time to get traction, and it's a fraction of our original vision. 
Historically, years of underinvestment in the industry as a whole throughout the UK, dare I say, has left the UK behind many other countries in this sector. I don't wish to sound negative, but the UK had a really strong legacy from offshore oil and gas, including incredible knowledge and skills of North and Irish seas and a long industrial history. And the country didn't seem to see the jewel that it had to create an incredible and sustainable homegrown supply chain. But it wasn't just supply chain. The Round One Offshore Ormond Wind Farm was actually conceived as a hybrid technology project jointly using offshore wind and gas to help extract marginal reserves and to make the efficiency of the power production even better and more economical. And the aim was to do this without government subsidies. But the vision wasn't in the wider sector and certainly not in government. It also wasn't present in the fossil fuel sector either. Wind, oil and gas became in many quarters arch enemies rather than friends from different walks of life. We only truly started seeing that relationship start to change now after some stops and starts and not a moment too soon. Unfortunately, we lost the early mover advantage and with some key elements of it, our supply chain, and we watched some of our innovators and skilled workers leave the country. As the country now barks on its next phase of development, more offshore wind, floating turbines and green hydrogen, I think we can learn some lessons from the early days of our offshore wind development. The early bird catches the worm and we need to position ourselves for green hydrogen and floating wind. Again, I feel we're a little behind than some of the other countries are doing now. It's not just everyone in Europe wanting a piece of the pie. There is real global competition here. But it's encouraging to see much earlier collaboration between government, local agencies, businesses and key infrastructure who are now all working together to capture these opportunities. In the past, that took an excruciating long time to happen. It seems we have learned that lesson. How are we going to take the opportunity to build a vibrant supply chain that allows for economic win-wins between developers and owners and the supply chain? I think we can learn from oil and gas industries as it has always worked with suppliers to ensure that they have healthy companies available to supply to their projects. In wind, this is not necessarily the case today. We know that IRRs are lower in wind than in offshore oil and gas, and yet governments globally still pump billions in to subsidise oil and gas, approximately 400 billion in 2018. Nuclear subsidies are also there in the millions, but are even more opaque to understand. But the subsidies per se isn't the issue. It's the unlevel playing field that wind competes in. We don't pollute like other technologies, and yet there is still little economic upside for our clean power. Carbon markets, for one, have struggled to provide real value to our bottom line. With the backdrop of the UK and many other countries' planned growth for wind and green hydrogen, one could expect that wind turbine manufacturers are gearing up for expansion, and yet currently they have a downturn in their fortunes. Currently, their supply chains, interest rates, and a continuing pipeline that goes from start, stop, and again and again that happens. And so now we see them restructuring, looking at redundancies at a time when we should be seeing them retain their talent for expansion. We need governments world wide and financial institutions to provide more value quickly into our industry. Divest out of subsidies, including technologies through planned transitions and do it quickly and more robustly. In my opinion, big finance and investment has been pretty late to the party. ESG until recently had been more about small scale technology in developing countries. While a solar pump may be life changing to a small village, the needle shift in the scale of climate change and biodiversity loss is tiny. And it used to be that we used to say that climate change, well, the next generation will suffer. We are the next generation now. Financial sectors have been focused on too many small projects. And yet, even with this focus through the UN protocols, et cetera, poorer countries have really struggled to access bigger financial institutions to help with large uh, scale abatement projects. In Western countries, our financial sectors have been keener to focus on valuing insurance, mortgages, communications, cheap coffee and food. The latter, neither which is good for us or the planet. Thank goodness we have the metaverse and Netflix to help us deal with the pending climate and biodiversity catastrophes that we've all created. We need big finance to get a big rig along. It needs to get involved at every level of the supply chain. That includes banking institutions shifting its focus on where and how it funds and to whom. We need government to stop eating itself, and the UK isn't alone here. We need to truly foster innovation and not be afraid for it sometimes to fail. Has anyone tried to get an innovation grant? I've not met anyone who said it was easy or they've fitted the prescriptive and restrictive box of criteria to do so. 
We seem to be afraid to try new ideas without a cast iron guarantee of a return. And that is where government should step in and foster R&D programs with a percentage of failure built in and meeting that percentage is deemed as a success. Not knowing what doesn't work and knowing what does are some of the best learning curves. As Sir David King has intimated, we need to try everything we've got to tackle climate change. We need a good plan today and not a perfect one tomorrow. Opportunities don't come to be successful from sitting on the fence or waiting at the back of a queue. We need to be bold. We need to be quick. We need to learn to fail fast and build on such failure. We need more youth in our industry and more women and wind is failing on this. And we need people from different walks of life and background. That is how you think differently to coin a phrase of another successful business owner. Kermit the Frog was right. It isn't easy being green. And anyone who works in development or is an SME trying to win orders or employees trying to meet IRR hurdle rates in big ones know that it's often way too harder than it should be. Our industry is on the right side of history. Offshore wind has the power to make a huge difference. When I think back to the 40 people in that meeting room in 2001, I think of the quote from Margaret Reed, the famous anthropologist, never underestimate the ability of a small group of committed individuals to change the world. Whether you're in a small company or can find a small group of like-minded people in a big company, we all have the ability to tackle the climate changes ahead. And to let Kermit have the last word, somebody thought of it, somebody believed it, and look at what it's done so far. What is so amazing that keeps us stargazing and what do we think we might see? Someday we'll find it, the offshore connection, the lovers, the dreamers and me. Thank you very much. Look forward to some Q&A. Thanks, Megan. Um, that, that, that was um, great. Thank you very much. If we could move on to Jamie, please. Um, that would be lovely. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And apologies, everyone. I'm, I've got problems with my laptop, so I'm actually on uh, on my mobile phone here. I don't know if you... Um, I've got a one-page kind of slide. Um, I think Maxine is about to, to share that, so I'll just talk this through. Um, really interesting stuff there from, from Megan. Uh, great to hear a potted history of, of the industry and I would agree with much of uh, what she said particularly around the supply chain issues uh, and where that where they're derived from and, and what what issues they are now causing and I will touch on that briefly in, in in my overview but I very much wanted to come from it from my personal experience really of the, of the last six to well four years but particularly the last six months having just gone through the examination phase um, of our development consent order for, for Hornsey Project 4 and for those who don't know it's it's really the um, is that the application we, we obviously have to get our consent for offshore wind farm before we can then think about securing the finance and the examination is really the the culmination of that application where it is uh, you, you have a board of examiners who will then ask lots of uh, questions um, and try and kind of find out the detail perhaps dig digging holes to try and find out where, where there's potentially holes in your application so it's it's the kind of most intense time for the application and uh it's certainly an intense time and it has been for the team um now one of the things the government announced earlier this year is that they want to reduce the time it takes to to from four years to, to one year um to, to get a consent to get a dco and that's going to be it's easy to say, it's a lot more difficult to, to actually put into practice. And what I wanted to set out here is really just four kind of things that we can do as developers to, to aid, um, I guess, government to, to try and actually fast track and get these um, get these projects consented. Uh, because really at the moment, and this was this came out actually a couple of days ago uh, by Win Europe, we, we're simply not building enough offshore wind to hit both the UK target of 50 gigawatts by 2030 and also the Europe European target which I think is around 500 gigawatts um, and we need to we need to win Europe are asking for really almost a war footing um, kind of mentality to, to building out and and this idea that there should be an overriding public interest that should fast track that kind of uh, offshore wind development and renewables generally 
So what came out of the Haunted 4 experience? Um, well, I think one of the things we could do really to, to, to kind of fast track early on is take it, really meet with our stakeholders at the earliest opportunity and ideally with a, what I call a blank slate to, to kind of go and speak to um, people like Natural England or Marine Scotland in, in Scotland uh, uh, and be upfront with them at an early stage because I think that can, that can really help um, kind of iron out issues and, and and also be realistic and I think it's it's you're entitled to be realistic to those authorities as well you have, clearly have to listen to them but I think we have to be telling uh, these statutory stakeholders that you know, this has government support we want to work with you uh, as developers in a, um, a positive way as, as, as conscientious developers um, but we really do need to to, to crack on and stop beating these projects. So I think that's, that's a key thing. Do not ignore your stakeholders. Do go and see them and challenge them from the earliest opportunity uh, and listen to what they say. I also think we need to give government developer-led solutions. And I think we need to come together as an industry um, to provide those solutions. Um, and that is, that is happening. I don't think historically we've been particularly good at working with other competitors we've we've often seen as uh, ourselves as obviously things like bwa and and now renewable uk help help to do that and there's a number of forums that i think we are seeing developers come together and i've just mentioned a few of these here i've been involved with um, kind of air defense radar mitigation with a number of a number of project directors uh, working for other companies it's 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 an industry issue for the uk 75% of the capacity we hope to build out by 2030 has an impact on uh, a UK air defence radar. So it's a joint issue and it needs a joint solution. Uh, another area that certainly came up for Haunty 4 and has come up for a number of offshore wind projects recently is the need to provide um, compensation measures for, for, in particular for bird species, some bird species, also some benthic environments. And I'm really pleased to see that we're now finally seem to be making progress in having a more strategic approach to provide compensation measures it's a bit ridiculous that we are putting forward project by project by project is putting forward specific compensation measures it's surely a much better way to work if we can combine together work with um, the various stakeholders statutory stakeholders and agree to provide compensation on on a much bigger scale and as a, a joint effort and I think we as developers need to to lead that and I think finally touching on what Megan said earlier um, we need to be realistic with government about the issues we're seeing in the supply chain um, and this is global but also in the UK the U I think we need to be really clear that the UK government is not going to have both local content and ever reducing prices for CFD uh, strike prices uh, it, it, we, we are moving beyond that, and I think we'll see that at the next CFD auction round. Um, they can't have both. If we want to invest and build uh, the components for UK wind farms, then that comes uh, at a cost initially um, in terms of a, 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 a cost of increased, um, increased prices for CapEx in construction. Uh, obviously, there's huge benefits to doing that, but I think that's a, we, we have to be realistic. And I know those conversations are now happening with government, and it's quite interesting to see how those develop, because there are all sorts of things, particularly with the rate of inflation, and et cetera. And I think we're going to see, we could see some real pressure next year on some of these projects, which have assumed certain uh, a, a certain IRR that may be challenged as they try and secure prices things like steel and etc cetera, etc cetera. um i did want to very quickly mention the offshore transmission network review which is quite specific it it, it does tie into the kind of the two, the, fir the first two points but i think it's so important it's worth mentioning on its own we've seen um certainly the four projects bef offshore projects that went through their dco process prior to haunty four that onshore impacts are a political dynamite uh, and many of those projects around East Anglia. And I think we really need to accept that and work constructively with other developers and with National Grid uh, to think creatively about collaborating um, to minimise those, those onshore impacts. And we've got to be 
we've got to be genuine about it. We can't just be paying lip service uh, to to the OTNR. Uh, I think it's really positive, the OTNR, and I think we, yeah, I think it's up to us to 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 really engage with that as developers. It's we always say, or I've always heard it, that when people dig up a road and put a, a BT cable in, and then six months later go and do the water pipe, well, it's the same philosophy. We need to accept that um, we should be collaborating with other developers uh, when we're trying to connect onshore, uh, and obviously. Offshore connections is part of our OTNR and whether we have a kind of rings main and that's been talked about and connect offshore, that's obviously also another option, which I think is a bit further down the line. And finally, I just wanted to, this is something that does happen in Europe, but not in the UK as much, but um, before we uh, as developers receive a kind of a seabed lease, um, the Crown Estate will do what's called a plan level assessment and they've just done this for the, the, the round four projects that, that won, that's, that completed this summer, uh, a plan level HRA, Habitat Regulation Assessment. I think the time, again, if we really want to be serious about building out quickly, uh, there's an opportunity here to consider instead of a project by project approach and obviously i've mentioned that in terms of compensation but also we could consider a strategic approach to environmental assessment so that we could look to pool our data together and actually look to try and consent multiple projects together so kind of regions are of, of the sea or maybe consented for uh, for development that's one way one quick way of actually getting vast amounts, large amounts of consent projects consented and built out before 2013. I think it is going to take something of that scale to really make that 50 gigawatts for the UK a reality. So just to sum up, and I'm really, again, looking forward to any questions that come out of this, I think it is up to us as developers to, to give governments, not just the UK, but in Europe and globally, the solutions to allow the process to be sped up and upscaled. Uh, we need to come together and we need to be honest with our stakeholders and government about that process. So that's it for me. So thank you very much. I'll pass back to uh, the presenter. I think Sandra's connection might have broken. Should we just move straight on to you, Poppy? Yeah, that's fine, Alfie. No problem at all. Um, thanks, um, Megan and Jamie. That was really interesting. And um, I think from my experience and, and my um, uh, in the renewables industry, I don't have too much more to add to that. But what I do add is is really focused on um, and what was already tapped into by Jamie and Megan around the uh, how important it will be moving forward. Um, that we that we continue to engage our key stakeholders and inform uh, our public as is required and that we don't cut corners in regards to consultation. I think moving into a, a leaner consenting environment, I have taken down some notes that I, I want to share with you. So I think uh, moving into the future um, in terms of the, the energy security strategy for the UK and in the, in the very unusual environment we find ourselves in now, um, perhaps certainly in our generation for the first time, um, it will be about striking you know, a, prudent, a prudent or sensible balance um, between meeting the need to increase national energy security, meeting out those renewables, um, energy or environmental commitments, alongside meeting our engagement and consultation requirements. Um, so from that consultation perspective, um, uh, our reconsideration of getting adequate inputs from the public and those interested in or impacted by future energy projects, it is imperative that we that we avoid shortchanging our stakeholders or compromising engaging with our key consultees um, as we navigate our way through a dramatically changing energy and consenting landscape, which let's face it, we don't really know how that's going to unfold yet. We're, we're kind of making guesses based on changing strategy and how, how experts and those who have been in the industry for a long time um, kind of anticipate that things will unfold. Collaboration and consultation takes time. And good consultation, as Jamie just um, highlighted, it is founded on good working relationships steeped in trust and transparency. And can we build such relationships within a potentially significant leaner regime? I, I'd, I'd say we will be challenged to do that. And we'll need to find out um, ways of doing that within the best practice environment. 
Um, if we are encouraged to reduce or eliminate stakeholder objections more quickly or more efficiently, potentially, in terms of um, cutting those timeframes down, um, we, we potentially risk a good solid wrangling of issues with our stakeholders, um, whether during periods of, of formal consultation or not. So for me, I think the key um, the key question um, in terms of my role in the changing environment would be how do we avoid consultation uh, and necessary stakeholder engagement becoming a mere box ticking exercise. I mean, it's it's kind of worth coming back, moving back a little historically that Megan did earlier on with her talk in a different context. Um, and in terms of uh, co consultation itself, the, the guiding principles of, of legitimate public consultation within the UK, I'm from Australia, they were only reinforced about 20 years ago um, in a case from 2001. And so those principles, as we're probably all familiar with, but um, for example, consulting on proposals at a formative stage. So we need to ensure we still carve out enough time within a leaner regime to consult on formative plans and, of course, to provide sufficient time for that intelligent consideration um, of our plans within that leaner future consenting regime. Um, the UK and Welsh Government targets, I mentioned Welsh Government targets because I'm currently working on a, a Welsh project in North West Wales for an offshore wind farm uh, called Aula Moor. Um, so those targets do provide a positive backdrop for opportunities from offshore wind. So I'm going to move over a little bit now to touch on some supply chain matters. Um, we all know about the uh, increased target um, up to 50 gigawatts now of offshore wind by 2030, a mere eight years away. Um, the annual contract for difference auctions um, will help with a more regular and certain pipeline for developers and suppliers, we hope. And supply chain plans um, are already becoming, um, and I'd say will become an increasing part of a project's contract for difference application for the construction phase and beyond. Um, they, the targets support local, regional and industry-wide growth, um, supporting local businesses, innovation activities, skills initiatives, um, and infrastructure development. So um, I mean, an example of, of one of the challenges we're facing is around ports and manufacturing development. So how do we um, ensure that uh, ideally local ports um, are um, set up adequately in order to support um, this massive increase in offshore wind development? Um, and how do we work with our uh, stakeholders to ensure that happens and, and you know again coming back to that good dialogue um, between stakeholders around meeting those targets and all of the um, the implications that that entails as well skills development supply chain growth and local contracts jobs construction and also longer term skilled jobs um, and I was just chatting with um, uh, our project supply chain manager Helen Thomas before the call um, to kind of uh, get up to speed a little bit on how this all ties together with our supply chain um, and, and she said, look, of, of course, there's a huge supply chain capacity and capability angle to the future development of offshore wind that presents a massive opportunity, but also a threat if we don't get it right. Um, for example, uh, within RWE, the company we both work in, um, we are working both at an industry level, leading the Offshore Wind Industry Council or OWIC supply chain work stream and working with government to help inform which supply chain development is needed most urgently, but also at a project level by, via supply chain plan development and via local clusters such as the Offshore Energy Alliance to get the message out to local businesses. The Offshore Energy Alliance referred to um, is the one based around Liverpool Bay in northwest England and also in um, in North Wales area uh, in vicinity of the project I'm working on at the moment. So at the moment, the supply chain and manufacturing conundrum could risk the future of offshore wind development in our country um, in a world where all markets globally are wanting the same. Thing. So we need to, to crack that, that nut now. So our colleagues in supply chain um, uh, sectors within our own projects and within the companies we might be working with or, within or consulting firms, um, they are all working hard to kind of um, uh, find solutions, you know, within this potentially uh, fast-tracked regime we might be moving into. I think to kind of close off for me, um, to come back to some of the, the key points um, of significance from my perspective would be, you know, we need to carve out those good, solid, open key stakeholder relationships early on, as, as Jamie touched on. This will help us as things speed up. Uh, we can turn to our stakeholders to continue that dialogue and work together more closely into the future, into what I would call an aspirational energy landscape, because we have targets, as we know, we always have energy targets or government targets, but um, to what extent we meet them will be up to us. And it will be up to us engaging um, 
which, which Megan and, and Jamie touched on as well, with the with the government and working with them and having um, having those inputs, um, you know, and with with the government and our our local government stakeholders as well, and working with them to make sure that that we meet we meet those other targets whilst we move towards getting more offshore offshore wind um, projects uh, developed and built. Um, so engaging with our stakeholders regularly regarding our early project assessments and thereafter as the project is refined in hand with stakeholder feedback as we as we receive it. And, and lastly, we need to harness a coordinated approach with other key stakeholders or competitors uh, more so than ever uh, as we enter a climate of increased cumulative impact or effect, whether offshore or onshore, whether from a visual impact potentially or onshore in terms of you know, more substations being built and the impact on landscape and the environment as well, whether we uh, produce above ground or uh, below ground um, cable routes and so on. Um, I, I would I would wager that that's going to become an increasing um, focus as well as we move into the changing landscape. So thanks everybody, that, that's, um, that's it from me today as a, a kind of intro. Oh, that's that's great. Um, thank you, Poppy, for for that. Um, I mean, something that comes across on all of them, um, all of your different presentations, is this um, obvious cooperation, coordination, talking together. Um, be it for getting projects through the the consenting and the development phase through to construction, um, the supply chain, skills. Um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of work to to be done there um is that my certain take home and it's just hoping that all those um groups that are formed do sort of keep that keep that momentum going to to make sure that the delivery um is is going to be a possible one um there are um, a couple of questions that have um come up here I will uh, I can't actually see the Q and A's directly so they're being copied in to me. Um, so I'll just read through. So we've got one from Phil Buckley. Um, our speakers haven't mentioned um, I think it means the marine uh, the mariner the massive increase in power production is going to take a lot of our complex sea space a space that will need to be shared with shipping how will that work i mean that's very much the case um obviously there's been a huge pressure on um seabed and you know um on, on the auctions and and who gets allocated what um that sort of viable space is being um, restricted and that's where I suppose floating um, is providing us sort of a, a wider option or to increase the, the the potential of that however it's still this interaction with um, with shipping that is going to continue um, to, to increasingly be an issue so um, who, who would like to want, um, answer that one is that one for you Jamie? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer that one. Uh, I'm I'm Thank happy you. to hand over the supply chain questions to, to Megan and Poppy. Um, I, well, I'll answer because it actually came up on Hornsey Four, and I, I want to compare it to one uh, actually where it was a consent issue for for Vattenfall's Thanet extension, where it actually was refused. The DCA was refused, but on, largely on shipping ground. So it it is taken seriously by the authorities, and as a result, by developers and um, yeah again it goes back to what Poppy said and I said about early engagement with stakeholders on, on Hornsey 4 we we had a had a big workshop with 25 um, uh, stakeholders from Trinity House to the MCA to individual shipping organizations such as DFDS which was one of our main concerns and and we we came to a solution and we we gave up a bit of our array um, but we felt it was important that we you know that we did that to ensure that we we, we could um, work constructively with our stakeholders so that's and that's really led to a really good relationship they understood um, they were concerned about obviously the ever increasing amount of offshore wind and it's up to us as developers to take those seriously and it, it, it ended up with us you know actually reducing you know, carving out a, a chunk of uh, of the, the Haunted Fall array. So um, I think it just goes back to the point that we have, you know, you, you're honest, 
you engage early and you, you you know you try and build those relationships um the crown estate who obviously manage the seabed uh, are well aware of the competing interests and it isn't just shipping it's fisheries it's carbon capture storage it's new oil and gas licenses this is it's it, you know and obviously offshore wind so it's nothing different i guess but it's all about building a good relationship mm. with those particular stakeholders and know. that leads quite nicely to, sorry on to um a, a second question which is whether um the panel feel that environmental and public consultation um constraints to uh sorry that there will be fewer constraints um, both environmentally and through public consultation um, as we move towards floating um, wind um, as opposed to the sort of more uh, the, the fixed foundation um, offshore sites that, that we have are there likely to be less um, issues related to floating wind um if I may, I mean, the first thing I would say there, uh, the, kind of, the thing that kind of comes to mind for me is just that your comes back to something <laughs> talking about last week is the importance of mapping your stakeholders. Your stakeholders will change. Um, you know, you, you may theoretically have fewer, but actually it's just about it's about mapping your stakeholders in that case that you know, they might be further off shore so to speak but as we know at this stage projects are still coming on shore for the connection so um yeah for me it would be about you know you do you do your mapping early on you find out who your stakeholders are and you start engaging but um not to i don't think we should diminish um uh, you know this this notion of, of um perhaps less intensive or less stakeholder engagement um being necessary for um, for floating wind. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. And I think it also taps in or bleeds into that notion of cumulative impact and how that might um, how that might transpire in future as well and what that will actually look like. That's probably mm. probably be my input and what springs to mind initially at least. Okay. Yeah, I'd agree with, with that, Poppy, entirely. Slightly different stakeholders and maybe a different emphasis, but I think we're going to see plenty of uh, issues because of climate effect, I mean, fisheries, for example, is going to be a really interesting one because yeah. you know, these, are, these are anchored to the ground and are arguably mm -hmm. floating foundations are going to be more disruptive uh, to, 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 yeah. to fishy, local fishermen and fisheries than, yeah. than fixed, for instance. Um, just wanting to get through a, a, a couple more questions here. Um, so another one was, where do you feel um, is the supply chain bottleneck? Um, does it lie in production facilities? Is it in sort of lay down space? Is it the skilled workforce that we're going to need to, to deliver um, all of these sites, vessels? Um, quite a critical um, one that's um, under huge pressure, um, even with the, the, the sites that we have and the ones that are in development at the moment for surveys um, alone, let alone con construction. Um, ports, suitable ports, um, sort of where, where do you, which do you feel are the key bottlenecks? And you can't say all of them. <laughs> that was exactly going to be my answer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the constraints are across the board. Uh, you know, when we look at the targets, and I think Poppy, you alluded to, you know, just the the step up that we're going to need to do to hit the targets. Uh, you know, it is needing. Like I think Jamie, you said a wall footing. I I completely agree. We need a wall footing on mm -hmm. multiple fronts to and. And a lot of investment has to come in, and this is what's my point about the finance industry. This, in, this investment in the supply chain won't come if the finance industry aren't supporting, you know, every element of that supply chain to make it happen because it takes money to make big investments and there have to be risks that have to be taken. And that burden often falls uh, directly onto the Tier 1 suppliers or the developers. And if the projects are considered marginal, um, or struggling to meet hurdle rates, um, it's very difficult for them to sustain that broadly on their shoulders. And that's why you need this really collaborative approach across supply chain. Just like with stakeholders, you need early engagement with supply chain. For example, I used to work for General Electric. And one of the things I constantly found with, you know, companies who were wanting to get into the supply chain was a lack of understanding about how long it took to get qualified. 
So if you wanted to become a tier two supplier to a tier one supplier like GE, we were talking sometimes two to three years before you could be qualified. Um, the inspections that, you know, the financial stability, you know, um, know your customer, you know, money laundering, all those kind of things that go on with being validated and qualified take an enormous amount of time. And then you get onto the technical qualification. So I think early engagement, getting businesses and, and infrastructure to understand what it needs to do to be able to meet this challenge, um, you know, it has been a steep learning curve for the UK as a whole about time that it takes. So early engagement, again, is very critical. And, and watch technology as well is the other thing, is technology changes. You know, you look at the scale-up of turbines from the early stages of round one to where we are, where we're heading towards 20 megawatt machines. You're going to start seeing that the component sizes changes, lay-down areas need to be larger, efficiency on ports and how we roll to get these, you know, these projects into the water and built. It takes some real innovation and different thinking than we've had before. Yeah, thanks, Megan. I mean, I, I, I'm not, my role is not supply chain, as I mentioned earlier on, but to add to what Megan said, I think, um, you know, we're seeing more, the, the call now for more um, outline skills and employment plans, for example, to be submitted even um, during or as part of the DCO examination phase uh, or, or kind of shortly thereafter. But something that springs to mind for me as well is, is two things. One is around, and, and what Megan re referred to, is um, is that kind of time frame. So, how do we give the heads up to potential suppliers now uh, in order to in order to, for them to be ready to deliver what we need to deliver in say 10, 15 years time? But in parallel to that is that notion of local content, and I'm thinking local content in terms of in terms of skills and employment. So um, other than sort of STEM education programs in primary and secondary schools, how do we um, you know how do we upskill and train and introduce more apprenticeship mm -hmm. programs and educate? Um, proportionately in line with this anticipated influx of um, of workforce that we that you know is part of the government's um, uh, aspirational um, plan for, for the future over four hundred thousand uh, and so on. So I, I think it's um, we need to kind of start doing that now. And I mentioned the offshore energy alliance, but um, we, you know we are seeing more skills and employment plans. Uh, the call for those being incorporated into the DCO process um, uh, and also that that importance of local content, uh, of course, there's post-Brexit market now and the implications of that. But um, I think it's really far-reaching. And to answer the uh, to answer the um, the audience member's question in terms of the bottleneck, yes, I'm not, I'm not really, I don't really know what the bottleneck is, but I do think it's about acting now. Uh, across mm. those areas you mentioned, because ports as well, it, it's a really expensive infrastructure investment, as we know, and, um, and you know, companies and developers are working um, with local governments and things to try to, you know, secure that investment locally if they can, but that presents its own challenges. It really is a complex, um, a good question, but a complex one, I think, in terms of that bottleneck aspect. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything to add, Jamie? Well, the only thing is vessels. <laughs> Yeah, I do yeah. think we are going to, I mean, <laughs> we almost need to have a moratorium on the three, the three big turbine supplies that they, they're not allowed to increase their turbines for five years. And so we'd have this because it's getting a bit ludicrous. I mean, I thought actually Vesta, Siemens and G had kind of got some kind of implicit arrangement where they weren't, none of them were going to announce ever increasing capacities. But uh, I think that's gone out of the window with recent announcements. But the problem is there aren't the vessels. I mean, so even if these turbines exist, there simply are not enough vessels. Mm -hmm to forget the fact the floating foundations um mm. there is not enough vessels to to put in these extra large monopiles and these huge turbines at the moment i mean yeah. it's just we are hitting that is a massive bottleneck and that's priority number one would be my yeah. argument yeah I, I tend to agree with you there because if you look at the not just beyond the uk market you've got huge targets here but i work globally so the targets we have in asia the countries we're seeing coming on board huge wind farms in Japan, in Korea, you know, Southeast Asia, Latin America, you know, the Brazilian coastline, they're opening up for offshore wind. And you look at that and you think, my goodness, um, we don't have the infrastructure globally um, around the world. So coming back to the point about marine sector, actually, there's opportunity in marine as well. If we look at offshore wind moving to green hydrogen, we are going to need vessels to transport hydrogen around from areas of high wind 
in mm. export markets like I see in Latin America back into consumption markets like Europe. So there's there's opportunity also from this sector for for the marine industry, um, you know, to be able to take a piece of that pie as well and ha- and be part of the success of it. I bet again, like- you know. The time it takes to build a vessel is not a short period of time. Again, to get the infrastructure yeah. investment, you know, is also long and lengthy. And this is where I'm very passionate about seeing the finance industry start really stepping into gear. We need them, and we need them now. Yeah. Hmm. And and this leads to the whole to to one of our last um, questions um, with a few minutes to go, where it is that the time scale, and we're talking, you know, 2030. Um, you know, 50 gig by 2030. And one of the the last um, questions was, surely the best way to speed up and streamline the process is for Crown Estate and Marine Scotland um, to, um, or Crown Estate Scotland, to issue new leasing rounds. um, And so that, you know, all bidders will go in with the same information and it's an even playing field for everybody and that way, that, that will sort of generate the movement to just make sure that, you know, it, it's sort of kicked off in, in earnest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So have you got um, sort of any views on, on that, that approach then? I mean, it, uh, it goes to the point I was trying to make in my little uh, intro about strategic assessment. Yeah. If, if you get, if we're going to do that, yeah. I'd actually be tempted, and I think this is done elsewhere in Europe, but correct me if I'm wrong, where... It's almost the Crown State doing the environmental assessment uh, as a as a kind of region. Uh, yeah. Whether we can get towards that, I, I, I don't know. But it does seem to be a lot of. I mean, we're collecting a lot of the same data, and we're not sharing it. And I know the Crown yeah. State have now got this library, and they're trying to do it. it it does make more sense that I think the problem we've got is, what's the Crown State's role in this? If their if their if their main priority is to make, you know, without being too blunt make as much money as they can then the way they're doing it you can't say you know they've achieved that with round four they made a lot of money by by deliberately only releasing six gigawatts of of seabed um and allowing us as developers to fight over it so um i think there is a moral responsibility on the crown estate and perhaps crown estate scotland to to do more than that um because i don't think it's in the interest of the country or or, or its people um and ultimately the crown estate is managers for, for the queen so or the king i should say the, the, the royal estate so i think there was an interesting yeah. moral dilemma there um but yeah if we are going to hit the, hit the targets i think that's the only way it's going to change for the crown estate to release it and possibly even to do a lot of the assessment work themselves or at least work with developers a lot more collaboratively yeah. on that I'll pass over to the others. Yeah. No, I, 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 I would I would absolutely um, agree on that because there's the there's a supply side delivery um, sort of in in the ground um, or in on the seabed, um, but then there is all that upfront time which is in the in the in the consenting in the in the surveys in the sort of that that development phase which is in itself very long and it's finding a way to to sort of shorten that that time scale. But it seems that at the moment a lot um, is being pushed onto the developers. This government saying, "Oh, you know, make make this shorter, work faster, <coughs> reduce time, deliver all of these um, our, our targets." When yeah, it, it's a much wider um, issue that involves many parties, and I think we've only really just touched on on um, some of those um, today. But it's been really interesting for me um i've I've certainly um sort of learned a lot i hope everybody um has enjoyed it we've run out of time um we're at 11 so this has been recorded so we'll be available to people to to sort of view um offline also so thank you for your time um and attendance um to this to this webinar and i'm sure we'll all meet in different um, different forums and take this discussion further. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy Thank the rest you of so your day. Much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.